this is Parson with Babel Bridge, and uh, here's roughly what I'm going for. I'm going to spend about half the time overviewing parsing in general, history of, the theory of, those sort of things, and then the other half I'm going to basically give you a, a live demo of my project, Babel Bridge. So, um, what is parsing? And I, it's kind of cool, I was watching another presentation, got a little definition that's taking unstructured data and making a structure. So that's just a general description of parsing, which in computer science usually means converting a string into a tree. So you got some string of characters, and we want to make some sense out of it, and usually parse it into a tree structure, and then we do something from there. So here's a quick example. Um, we're going to take that string, and the first inner step is to take out 1, 2, 3, and 5, and put them as children nodes of a plus node. And then we will then take the times 4, and then times the root node, and on the left is the plus, and the right is 4. And then we get evaluate. This is a very high level overview, we'll get to more details. So, parsing shows up pretty much everywhere with programming, even though we don't really talk about it daily, uh, which is a little ironic. But obviously, every time we hit the compile button or we run the interpreter, some parser is taking our string of text and tr translating it. Um, network protocols also, HTTP, um, LDAP or IMAP or any number of these other things are all protocols that are strings of text going over the networks. That's all the network does is strings of text. And on the other end, it has to convert that string of text into something meaningful. So it's parsing. Syntax highlighting, for obvious reasons, you need to understand the language in order to be able to tell what to highlight. Um, command lines, you're taking a string of text, you're parsing it to something that alters the run of the program, save with configuration files. Query languages are given another language. So there's all types of times we're taking these text files or strings of data, streams, and we're converting them into something meaningful. Last one I throw up as a more general thing, which is API design. Um, a lot, most APIs have some amount of string parsing involved in them, particularly if you're doing anything along the lines of web services, in which case you've got a lot of string parsing coming in, either as just the raw HTTP request, or maybe that's processed a little bit for you, but then you get the params and the values of the params, you still have to parse those. What's interesting is that we have a lot of actual tools for generating parsers, and uh, that's pretty much where they're used at the moment. They're used for actual programming languages. They're pretty much not used for anything else, which is a bit of a problem, and I'll give a couple examples. Uh, network protocols, so what is the state of art in, uh, uh, parsing in a high-performance network daemon? Well, it's pointer arithmetic. So, <laughs> And Apache's got 2,200 lines of buggy, handwritten C code parsing all this information that's coming in. It's serving up two-thirds of the world's networks. Okay. Result is, obviously, buffer overflow problems. That's why we have exploits all the time. So when you hear high-performance network daemon, and this is pretty much true for all open source daemons out there. Almost all of them are handwritten code because they think it's fast. You should really do that in high throughput exploit server. <laughs> Um, config files, for any of who's dealt with your Etsy directory, dealt with config files on any Unix or OS X machine, they're all ugly. They're all really just like the opposite of the minimum the programmers can get away with. They're usually pretty fragile. Stuff like Crontat has a very specific format. If you vary just slightly, it just doesn't work. Um, so it seems to suggest there's this dichotomy between human and machine repeatability, but that's baloney. It's no tweet. We have programming languages that are both human and machine readable, so there's no reason why the rest of these things couldn't be. Artifact. Right, absolutely. Um, and this is a great little example. I, I stole some of, the, some of the cons of these slides from another presentation, which I'll credit at the end. Um, but basically, he said, <laughs> I agree that XML is not the answer. It is a compromise to the problem that does not exist. It is neither human or machine readable. Um, so here's the syntax highlight in my last my examples of where it sucks. Um, this is pretty much the art for syntax highlighting. See example. Um, it does great for built-in keywords, but as soon as you want to define your own types, it all of a sudden doesn't know that it should be syntax highlighting all types. So that's really what it should look like, but it has to actually parse your file in order to know that to highlight all your types. So um, now I'm going to dive into parsing theory. I promise not to dive too deep, but I think it's good to have an understanding of the foundations. Um, so formal grammars, uh, grammar is how we describe a language, and a language is what we're parsing. It's some concept of some legal string that we can parse and make sense out of. Um, so the formal grammar is actually just the format that we use to describe it. Usually they're expressed as a set of rules, and the format is backwards now form is sort of the standard BNF, so 
doesn't matter too much, but if you run across it again somewhere else, you know what BNF stands for. It's for describing a park server, basically. So here's a quick example using the is now form BNF. Um, here's a rule D, and D can be one of the 10 digits. Um, a local phone number is three digits, a dash, and four digits. And area code is three digits. And then a full phone number could either be the area code in the parentheses and then a local number, or just a local number. So this is a simple grammar that you can accept a, area, a phone number with or without an area code. So classes of grammars, way back in 1956, Norm Chomsky came up with this hierarchy and it's pretty much still state of the art in terms of how we understand these things. Uh, at the core is regular grammars, which are regular expressions. Uh, when you write a regular expression, you're actually describing a grammar for a language, the specific thing you want to search for. And anything, regular expressions can express any regular language. So you already have a fair amount of experience at this level. Context-free grammars are a superset. They include all regular expressions, and pretty much it's all programming languages are context-free. Um, and that's what BNF is designed to work with. BNF describes context-free languages. But there's a bigger subset, which is context-sensitive languages, which broadly you can think of most human languages being context-sensitive. I'll give one or two more examples of what they are, but mostly we don't deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis, even if you're dealing with parsing. <laughs> Um, and then even beyond that is what's called recursively enumerable, which is all possibly computable languages. Um, and the term recursively enumerable specifically refers to, can you write a program that can, one after another, just spit out all possible strings that could possibly match? And obviously it run forever, even on similar languages, but this is the theoretical superset of all possible languages that we can talk about intelligently. So I'm just going to focus on the, the two base ones, on uh, regular and context-free. Um, regular grammars, the basic thing to know about them is they have no memory. Um, they know where they're at in the string that they're reading, and they know where they're at in terms of the pattern they're matching, but they don't have any memory of what they've seen previously. So it's easy to go through and match one, two, three, because it just keeps knowing I need to match another digit, I need to match another digit, it doesn't care what matched previously. Same with the string of letters, but it can't match nested parentheses, because by the time it gets to that first closed parenthesis, it doesn't know how many parentheses it's seen before. It just knows, oh, there's another parenthesis. So it can't actually guarantee, it can't make sure that that parenthesis match. Context-free grammars do have memory, um, basically hierarchical memory, trees like we talked about, converting a string into a tree. And so therefore they can match parentheses, but there's still things they can't match, which don't normally think about this because usually we just stop context-free and move on, but here's a couple of interesting examples. One thing they can't do is if you want to match, say, parentheses and square brackets, and you want to make sure they're paired up, but they can overlap without necessarily being nested. And the problem with that is you can't break that up into a tree. If they were separate, then you could put the friends on one side and the square back on the other, then you get a tree. But since they overlap and they intertwine, it's a graph structure. So it's a more complicated thing. The second example here is you couldn't say, match me an arbitrary string of characters, and then later, match me exactly that stream stream again. So that would be referring to the context that you're in. And that context-free grammars can't do that. Um, Languages kind of tend to have some of these constraints, um, but what they do is they parse it with a context-free grammar and then they apply semantics to the tree. So you can do some, like, you know, that this, this string has to match the exact same string as previously. Once I parse it, I can go over and look at the tree and then determine that that's the case. But that's sort of the post-parsing step. So we kind of hack in a little bit of non-context-free stuff when we're working with things, but we don't consider that the parsing phase. So that's the... Uh, sort of standard state of the art, that's your uh, compiler's class 101 right there, without explaining how they work. Um, parsing expression grammars is a new, relatively new concept, and here's how it fits into that same tree, um, the same hierarchy. So they were formalized in 2004, um, but they're not that complicated, so my guess is they probably were understood fairly well for a while, but they've only been recently applied. Um, they're almost the same as context-free grammars. They are both supersets of regular grammars, they're both subsets of context sensitive, and they have a lot of overlap between the two of them. <clears throat> but what's particularly interesting about the two of them is that parsing expression grammars are always unambiguous. There's always, if they match this exactly one tree that comes out, it's always the same tree. Um, context free grammars, which is, you know, that's if you guys ever took any classes in this, that's always what they covered, has, is, can be ambiguous sometimes. If you guys have ever heard of shift reduced conflicts, the bane of compiler writers' existence. I, I never quite figured out how to resolve those. I was just fiddled. Um, Would you best best to and and or chains in, in that, or is that a 
Well, that's sort of an example of the ambiguity, so let's just dive into that. Okay. Um, I was just, you know, the, the sort of finding operator uh, precedence. Right? Yeah, it's it it basically applying a precedence, and parsing expression grammars as part of its way it expresses things as a natural precedence. Um, but so here's a good example of the ambiguity. This is the standard C++ or Java if statement. This is pretty much exactly how it would be expressed in a grammar. Um, and you can basically can have a trailing us. Um, and so the question is, how do you parse this statement? So we've got an if, and then we've got another if. And basically, there's two ways we can parse it. We can either parse it as an if, and then the true part of that first if is a big if else. Or it could be an if with the true part being a small if, and then an else, which is the this ec equals to. And in the context free grammar, you would have to add some additional constraints in order to say that one would happen or one would happen over the other. In fact, I don't, I'd have to go test and see. I don't even know what the precedence is in C. I'm sure it's well defined. The else goes to the second hit. Yeah, it's, it's the closest binding, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which is, so you can do if, else, if, else, if, else, if, 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 and then else. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, parsing expression grammars wouldn't match this one the way I have it written, mm -hmm. but it would always write match exactly that one. And I will talk a little bit about that. But basically, you can think of them as being greedy. Basically, they will search down and find the first match that matches, and as soon as it does, that input's consumed and it will move on. It doesn't, if it finds, you know, it doesn't look for that second case. So, uh, parsing expression grammars, basically, they're inspired from regular expressions. So, we start with what we like about regular expressions. If you write, if you start in the BNF notation, you don't even have like Cleaning star and cleaning plus, which are just kind of nice things to be able to say, I want one more of these things. Those ways to express it, that's kind of tedious. So, the, the guy who worked with this stuff said, let's start with regular expressions, and let's just add the ability to name an expression and reuse it. So, for example, here we have a regular expression that matches any string without parentheses, and uh, then here we reuse it in another rule where the rule text, which can either match the no friends um, pattern, or it can match the text pattern in parentheses. And actually, those three rules, the two two rules of text, you know, either or, one or the other can match. Those three rules together would match any string of any string of text that had properly nested and matched parentheses. So, uh, Babel Bridge. Babel Bridge is my project. Um, it is a parsing, parsing expression grammar generator, so you can write parsers in it. It's in Ruby. Um, and there is one other I would like to mention, TreeTalk, another library that's more popular in Ruby. Um, but I didn't like that specifically because you actually had to write separate files and then compile them into Ruby and then run them. I wanted something I could just use directly in Ruby for small little parsers very easily without having to learn syntax and everything else. So here's a quick example. Um, once you install it, you just require Ruby gems and then require Babel Bridge. And to create a parser, you just do class my parser and you inherit from Babel Bridge parser. And then you start defining rules. Um, the rule is just a keyword rule, and then the name of the rule is a symbol, and then one or more patterns you want to match. In this example, this parser matches only the literal string foo. So if I create a new instance of my parser, I run parse on it, parse the string foo, I get back a parse tree. And the parse tree is this note, this class foo node, which it created for me, and it has one sub node, which is the string foo. So now I'm going to attempt for the first time a live demo. So basically, I have more or less the example we just did there. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go ahead and parse foo just like we were doing. And then run it. So there it just spits out the parse tree like I talked about. So I'm going to go ahead and make it actually take options from the command line. So if I pass in a string that isn't going to pass, it just by default returns nil. So it just said it didn't match it. Um, if I do too much, it's not going to match. If I do too little, it's not going to match. It only matches exactly foo. Um, so let's go ahead and make a more interesting parse tree. So I'm going to add another rule, bar, 
And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say it can optionally match bar. So if I say RubyFoo, um, it matched the string foo, but, but there's no bar, and that's okay. I can also add in bar, and in theory that should work. Why didn't it work? Oh, because bar, bar does not have, and not matching anything. All right, there we go. So there, so it matches foo, and then it has the sub node, which is the bar node, and it matches bar. So bar is completely optional. I can add bar or not, and it matches either way. Um, let's see what else fun we can do. So I can actually just insert a, random, a, a Ruby expression, regular expression here. So if I wanted to say, it can optionally be followed by a number. So foo bar is not going to match anymore because bar is not legal, but now I can append any number. It's just going to run that regex and fetch it. Can you get more? So full matches. So, so obviously, all those numbers together are one, one number, one right. integer. <clears throat> but is there a way you can um, get to two chunks of numbers? So if you wanted to, I mean, obviously I could do. Yeah, I guess that was the question. Would you have to edit that, or could you just change that regex to not to match? Well, we can change. We can put in any regex we want. So we certainly could do. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I guess what I, what I was asking is, does that rule, the first rule, the the bar optional? Does that mean only one instance of bar? Or that does mean one instance of bar. Okay. This probably would not how you'd want to do it. Um, because you don't you probably actually have it prefer it to match it in separate, in separate nodes, but I just did extend the regex to yeah, sure. any match of that regex. Right. Bar, right. But... Now I do actually have a really nice uh, shortcut. Well, that's basically the the cleaning star. So I can say I want to match many bars. So I'm going to change it back to just one or more digits. And uh, actually, this isn't going to quite work. So I need to. Um, so I just did as many actually as a little bit nicer than what treetop has, which just has a star function. Many lets me put in a delimiter. So it says match many bars with the delimiter, which is white space. So if I do this, now it'll actually match my three numbers, and I can also get whatever it matched for delimiters if I want to as well. So that makes it pretty nice for. Very often you want to do that where you've got some, some string of things, a common delimiter or whatever, you can just say match many of them with this delimiter and we'll just pull out the actual values and ignore the delimiters unless you want to grab them. So if you change the bar reg x and just get rid of the plus, single character, right. Right, then this is not going to not match because it, not it won't match because yeah, they're going to be too long. So if I just did single digits, it would work, obviously, uh, without the trailing white space. Or if I said it was optional space, then it should work. So that works, but I can also make them longer. Why is it telling you the delimiters? It's telling you which delimiters it used? So it, the delimiters, I mean, since the delimiter in this case is, is any amount of white space, I might have something like that, right? It's a lot of extra white space. So it does log the parts of the string it grabbed for the delimiters. Can you um, hit up again? I just, I just want to see what command reduce that. Right. So this was. So you have one space and then like many spaces. Right. And, then and so there's. You, what is it? Can you get that result? So we, there's one space, many space, and what's the two no spaces? Um, because we told it to only match single digits at a time, oh, it's, okay. it's doing a single digit and then no space and then a single digit and then no space. Um, because it's greedy and it's matching, if I just up this to many digits again and run exactly the same command, then we're only going to have those two spaces. One thing I like about parsing expression grammars is that because it's greedy, you can logic through what it's doing pretty well. You just step through it. It's, it's a very turnkey machine approach. You say, okay, it's going to match this now. It's going to go as far as it can. And if it matches the whole rule, then it's done. It succeeds. And if it failed, then it'll roll back to the end of that rule and then try the next rule. And it basically is pretty easy to incrementally walk through it. In fact, that's pretty close to how the actual algorithm works that runs it. There's some important optimizations so that if it it can end up trying the same thing multiple times, 
and those optimizations to make sure it doesn't spend too much time doing that. But I can't remember. Can you send regular expressions to a fork command? I don't know if you guys have fork in your Well, fork in terms of just Unix fork, right? Um, yeah. Like so you fork, on, fork a new process. process. You give it a string and you say, like, break it down into the, an array and fork it or a collection and give it what you Like if you said space, you, it would just look at everything. Like if in this case it would make a bunch of ints that were in an array right. and broken off by like the space. Right? So yeah, I think the Ruby equivalent command in Ruby is split, but you just you give it a, a pattern and it pulls those as delimiters out and then gives you an array of what the rest of the the rest of the content. Yeah. So let's go to a slightly more exa interesting example. Which is this one. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and require. Eh, I made a little um, helper library, which just basically is a little bit nicer way to run things here. So, so I'm going to make a simple calculator. So now we are just matching a number to start with. And so that just verifies that it actually works. My uh, included code just spits out the input I gave it, shows me the parse tree. And as you'll see here, it actually also, if I do something wrong, it now actually makes the right calls to ask what the error was. So in this case, it, I had put an extra space in my string. So it matched one, two, three, but it said it didn't match the entire input. Here is how far it got. Here's why it didn't match. If I start off like this, then it says it got just to the beginning of the input, and it said it was expecting something that would match that regular expression of 0 to 9 plus, and it didn't find it. So now let's make this a little more interesting. Let's make an add rule. It is a recursive definition. So if I just put in one, two, three, it matches that. If I do one, two, three plus 23, that's a slightly more interesting tree now. So you can see under the add node, it matched the uh, number one, two, three, which is a number node, or and then the plus symbol, and then it also matched the, uh, the rest of the string, which is the value 23. Um, so those two lines there, you made two possible matches for the Add. Right. So is, okay. And specifically, it just means that I don't have to do an add. So the, the first rule is the start rule. That's what map, that the whole thing has to match the first rule. And so when it looks at the expression that says, okay, I'm going to match add, either it can match a number with a plus symbol and then more adds, or it can match just a number, which is the termination of the, the recursion. And the order matters, I assume. Right. Um, one thing that is difficult about parsing expression grammars is you can't have left recursion. Whereas you can with context-free grammars, because basically every rule has to make progress. If it didn't make progress, it'd just get an infinite loop and just keep retrying itself forever. Um, so that's why I've got the add on the right-hand side, so the recursion is a tail recursion instead of a head recursion. So um, now let's actually make this particularly interesting. Let's make it do something. So the way I have set up this library is you can just pass in a block to any one of these rules, and you can define as many methods as you want, and these methods just get associated with the nodes of that parse tree node. So I want a method that's going to be called value that's going to return the value of uh, the calculation. And let's just start with number, because that's easiest. Um, 2s is running on self, so 2s just always returns the exact string that that rule matched. So I'm just taking the string of numbers, and then I convert it to an enter, and now I've got the value. In fact, I'm going to actually go ahead and accept negative numbers as well. So I just added a negative question mark to my ring expression, so now I'll accept negative numbers. So I'll just basically convert it to a number value. And so I'm going to do a slightly different call here. Demo value is just set up to call that value on my parse tree and display it. So if I say that, I get an error. Ha, 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 ha.
All right. Not sure why that isn't working, so we'll just do it the old way. So I create a parser, I parse the input, I call value on the result, and put it out. If I uh, call, let's just call inspect, actually, to be a little more explicit on value, which I guess actually in uh, Ruby is not going to show me anything different, because the inspection value of an integer is just the integer. But if it was a string, then it would have actually put it in quotes or anything else. So we know that it's specifically an integer. So now if I try this again, if I try it actually on the addition, um, all right, so it didn't give me an error, but there's a default implementation which just passes the call into the first pattern. So let's actually make it do something more interesting here. So I'm, two things here are a little bit magical. One, I'm just calling number and add, dot value, and those are dynamically defined methods. Um, so those get bound to the results of those subnodes. So when that rule add matches a number and an add, those two subnodes in the tree get bound to the, the method value number and add. So I can just call directly on number return might give me the value, on the add result will give me the value, and then I'm adding it together and then spinning it back up the tree. So now if I run this, it should actually add them together. What other thing than value you can call on the node? You can call anything you want. Value is a word, a name I made up. So this is just methods I've attached to nodes. Right. And there's two things magical going on again. There's the fact that I'm, there's these, the rules that you use for your pattern get automatically implemented as a method so you can access the results. And you notice on a few of these nodes, I did not define value. And particularly like if you're doing like a single here, like add number, there's a method missing which automatically pass method calls down the chain. So you don't have to find it at every single level. So you just return number dot value. Exactly, exactly. Which is useful because if we actually look at the parse tree again, you would see that we actually do have a add node in the middle <laughs> of those numbers, and otherwise I have to define it in a lot of different places, and it's just a little tedious. Um, so I think like I could drive it a little bit further and show you guys. Um, I actually had written up a spec that added multiply to it and did the precedence right, which is a little bit tricky. Um, but this is sort of the high-level overview. This is basically how it starts to work. You can pretty quickly define your grammar and then start putting some, some functionality behind it without a lot of effort. And it's right in line with your code. Um, you can instantiate multiple different parsers so it's thread safe as long as each parser is only used in one thread. Um, it's easy to make multiple different parsers. You just inherit it in different places. Which, in all those ways, I believe makes it quite a bit more flexible than treetop, which is not as easy to set up in that way. So I guess... Um, if you guys have any specific things you'd like to me to poke at the live demo, I'll just wrap up. Uh, what's the significance of the number in the class name for the nodes? In other words, you have a foo node one. Ah, good question. Um, let's. I mean, I'm sure you did that for a purpose. I did. But um, it prevents you from doing something like is a foo node. All right, so there's an example where we have add node one and add node two. Um, what that is referring to is the fact that we've got two different rules for add. Add node one is matching this first rule, and add node two is matching that rule. Oh, so you could have two add node ones in your got it. And, yeah, multiple instances of them, exactly. I thought it was just a count. Okay, fair enough. So, no, so that, that is specifically where each different alternative rule definition gets an incremental number. And so if I had three adds, there would be an add node three as well. Um, I toyed around with the idea of if there was only one rule, not having a number at all, but I think it's more consistent just to always have the add node one. Sure. So yes, you can do it as a kind of test. It just tells you. Yeah, it would be, would be kind of nice to be able to ask if it was either of the rules. And so maybe it might make sense to put an inheritance in between, which right. is just a, a base class, which doesn't do much. It just sits there as an identifier. Um, but largely, you should not have to actually introspect the tree very much, because pretty much you can attach, you can attach some methods to each node pretty easily. You don't have to actually have to make some external code that goes in and traverses the tree. Okay. Usually, you should be invoking methods on the tree, and the tree internally knows how to process itself based on the methods you've defined. Is that convention? Because that's different from my limited experience, with, where I just got a tree with simply a data structure. I 
external libraries. Right. Legally. Um, this is definitely what Treetop does. Um, okay. And I think, well, I mean, the, the, the traditional parser is Yak um, <coughs> on, on the CN of the world. So you take basically a BNF notation, you compile through Yak, it spits out some C code. Um, it's actually not earlier than that. You have to make a, a lexer also, and you have to specify your lexer, and you compile the lexer, and you can get them all linked, right? And there's lots of steps. But at the end of the day, that won't actually have any C code for processing it, because I think, I think you will just end up with a tree that you would then have to traverse. Um, and I think most of that's just a problem of it not being very OO, really. I mean, Yak is probably 30 years old, I don't know. It, it, it's not designed to be very OO. And it's also, it's, it's using its own language, and so that's part of the thing that made Treetop awkward, is it has its own files. And you can put Ruby in the files, but it's somewhat limited because it's its own language. And I wanted a more general, general structure. And there's, there's some interesting other things under the hood here I didn't demo, but... This is from my level. So, I think I only have my credit slide, which, uh, so Babel Bridge, that's, you know, just if you Google for Babel Bridge parser, you'll find it. Babel Bridge by itself doesn't seem to quite get it yet, even though there's nothing else that really matches it, so it doesn't come up very high. Um, but the main way web page is on Ruby Forge, is a pretty decent, um, just a couple page tutorial that gives you all the basics that I just showed you with concrete examples. Um, this is an excellent, excellent talk I've listened to recently by Matthew Might um, on the Stanford iTunes U talks. Um, he was proposing a new way to parse context free grammars with parsing of derivatives, which had some really interesting um, new benefits. So it was just a cool talk. But my whole thing about parses are important and we should think more about them, that was pretty much stolen from his talk, and he did an excellent job of it. So I want to give him credit for that. This is me, Shane Burton Davis. That's my presentation. Thanks, guys.